Greetings. My name is Stephen Orfei. I'm the general manager for the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council. Thank you for attending today. Very pleased to be with you. We are here today with our partners at the American Hotel and Lodging Association and some very distinguished speakers to address one of the most challenging problems in the hospitality industry, cybercrime. Cyber criminals are targeting all members of the hospitality industry right now, even as we speak. Depending on which research you subscribe to, members of the hospitality industry are among the top three of all targeted groups around the world. They're doing it because it's profitable, and unfortunately, it's relatively easy right now. But we hope to address that today. So today we'll have some good news for you all. There are solutions to the problems that are proven to work. Our guests are from AHLA, our core hotels, PCS, the Payment Security Compliance, and from our friends at the United States Secret Service. We'll shed some light on where the attacks are happening, how they are being perpetrated, and what some of the fixes are. I'm delighted to tell you that the council CTO, Troy Leach, will also be joining us to sum up where our security standards fit into the mix. For those of you who don't know the PCI Council, 10 years ago, stolen credit cards, counterfeit cards, and online theft of payment data was a big problem then as it is now. At the time, every major credit card brand had its own security requirements for protecting payment card data. That meant that every merchant, every bank, and every credit card processing company had to figure out how they could comply with the security requirements of five different credit card companies. The brands came together to develop a global security standards that would benefit the industry stakeholders. Rather than having multiple security standards by brand, and that was a big improvement. One security standard applied around the world to all companies who accept process credit card payments. And that is how the PCI Security Standards Council came to be. Standards for payment equipment, payment software, and standards for everyone who handles payment information, people, process, and technology. It's important that we maintain the trust and integrity of our payment system. There are those out there that are trying to undermine our confidence in the financial systems of the world. We also certify equipment used throughout the payments chain. We certify the people who are responsible for maintaining secure environments. This includes internal security people and external assessors and investigators. Our standards are battle-tested and proven. They're effective. In fact, a third-party report investigated that not a single entity that was breached was found to be in compliance. But we can't rest on our laurels. Our standards are comprehensive. They cover a wide variety of payment security challenges, from the very simple password to the complexities to proper protection of EMV chip, terminals, e-commerce, mobile payments, encryption, and tokenization. They're industry tested. PCI maintains lists of independent lab-tested applications and devices to help organizations like yourself choose the right technology that has been vetted and verified to deliver on its promise. I will now pass along the PCI's Director of Certification Programs, Jill Woodcock, who will be monitoring today's panel. I had the pleasure of working with Jill day in and day out. Jill coming to us live from the UK. Over to you, Jill. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. I'm happy to introduce you to our panelists for what promises to be a very insightful discussion on reducing the risk of breaches in the hospitality sector. So firstly, we have Vanessa Sinders, who is Senior Vice President and Department Head of Government Affairs for the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Vanessa oversees the association's advocacy efforts on Capitol Hill and with administration policymakers and is responsible for directing the government, Governmental Affairs Department 
in the development and execution of strategy for addressing the issues facing the lodging industry, including technology and distribution issues specific to the hotel industry, workforce and labour issues, as well as promotion of travel and tourism. She also directs the Association's Political Action Committee, Hotel Pack, and Grassroots Programme. Then we invite to speak Marie-Christine Fitte, who is Data Risk Manager from Accor Hotels. Marie-Christine is in charge of the PCI DSS Programme for Accor Hotels, which numbers 3,600 hotels in 92 countries. In the central working team, her mission is to adapt operational processes to achieve hotels' PCI DSS compliance. She has spent 20 years in the hospitality industry, and she specializes in the management of complex projects and scope, especially during times of major restructuring changes in organizations. Next, we welcome Special Agent in Charge, Stuart Tryon, who is a veteran of the United States Secret Service having served over 24 years in investigative, administrative, and protection assignments. In his role with the Office of Strategic Intelligence and Information, Stuart directly plans and coordinates all efforts involving the collection, evaluation, and dissemination of operational intelligence and information affecting the protective mission of the Secret Service. This mission covers every aspect of protective intelligence around the world. Then we have Tom Arnold, who is co-founder and principal and head of forensics at the payment software company, PSC. Tom specializes in digital forensics, internal and external security assessments related to US and international standards, and he uses his payments background to evaluate and design security controls and secure systems that accept a variety of traditional and emerging consumer payment technologies. At last but not, of, not least, we have Troy Leach, who is Chief Technology Officer from the PCI Security Standards Council. In his role, Troy partners with council representatives, PCI membership, and industry leaders to develop standards and strategies to secure payment card data and the supporting infrastructure. He is a Congressional Subject Matter Expert on Payment Security. So here is our agenda for the day. We'll be hearing firstly from Vanessa about the state of hospitality from the point of view of the hotel and lodging industry. Then we'll be moving into an operational discussion from Marie-Christine. Stuart will then talk to us about some very interesting findings from a Secret Service investigation of data breaches then Tom will move on and we'll discuss prevention, detection, and response from his experience in investigating data breaches. And lastly, Troy will tie everything together from a standards perspective. With that, I would like to turn things over to Vanessa from the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Thanks, Jill. First of all, thanks to PCI for spearheading today's webinar on such an important topic for all businesses, including hoteliers. We are very excited to be collaborating on these issues as collaboration is essential to combating cybercrime. I'm Vanessa Sinders, Senior Vice President for Government Affairs from the American Hotel and Lodging Association. For those that don't know us, AHLA, as we call ourselves, is the trade association that represents the breadth and depth of the hotel industry, from multinational chains to independent properties to small bed and breakfasts, as well as the ownership and management companies that own and operate many hotels. We are an organization that is increasingly focused on advocacy and communications being proactive on the issues that matter most to the industry and to hoteliers' bottom lines, and telling our industry story. So with that, I will start with an overview of the hotel industry. As you all know, our industry is in every state, city, and town across America, contributing to the economy, growing jobs, and conducting a significant portion of commerce, again, in every state, city, and town. We are 53,000 properties across the U.S. 
that total 5 million guest rooms. Moreover, 5 million guests come through our doors each day, and we employ 2 million people with hundreds of billions of dollars in contributions to state and local taxes. And when you think about a traveler's hotel stay from both a business and leisure perspective, a significant portion of their spend is on the hotel. On average, um, business travelers spend $147 per night on their room, their hotel stay, and for leisure travelers, they spend on average $131 per night for their stay. And when you think about all the data that goes along with each of those travelers and each of their transactions, it is extremely significant. And again, I think a big reason for why we're here today for this webinar and why it's so important um, to talk through ways that we can collaborate and protect all that data that is traveling through our networks. When you focus in on the current state of hospitality when it comes to cybercrime, and Stephen talked about this uh, at the beginning of the webinar, cybercriminals are increasingly targeting our industry and the attacks are becoming more persistent and sophisticated. The time that it takes to detect these attacks can also be significant. All of these data points illustrate the need for our industry, as well as all businesses, to continue putting a strong focus on efforts to manage risk and to stop these cyber criminals. If we look at cybercrime in the hospitality industry during 2015 last year, our industry faced some significant attacks, which again illustrates the important need for us um, on today's webinar. These breaches impacted some of the world's most prominent hotel chains. On the screen are two examples of major credit card breaches in total last year, no less than five major hotel groups and a hotel management company confirmed breaches in 2015. And here you can see the hospitality industry, which was targeted by a significant attack campaign that used point of sale malware to collect payment information from travelers our industry accounted for the second largest share of incidents, again, when you look across industries. And if we look a level deeper on the hospitality industry, corporate and internal networks made up 55% of compromised IT environments, while 45% were from payment systems point of sale. In a moment, you will hear more about how these criminals are getting in and steps you can take to combat them. But as we all know, the costs of these acts are high, not only fines, legal expenses, and audits after the fact, but also the cost through and in loss in guest confidence and loyalty is significant which we all know is at the heart of our business, which is why this collaboration between our industry and other public and private stakeholders like those on today's webinar to share information and work together on how to stop these cyber criminals is so important and why the American Hotel and Lodging Association is happy to be uh, participating on today's call. So with that, I will turn it back to Jill. Thank you, Vanessa. That was great. So let's now move on and let's hear from Marie Christine from Accor Hotels, who's going to give us an operational perspective. Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to introduce the Accor Hotel Group. Accor Hotels is more than 3,700 hotels in 92 countries. The majority of our hotels are located in Europe 
but also in Asia Pacific, Middle East, and Americas. They are divided by brand and management type. From luxury with Sofitel and Gallery Pullman, middle scale Novotel, Mercure, and Adagio, and economic scale Ibis Family. Key challenges for the hospitality industry with regard to PCI DSS. Card order data, CHD, is everywhere from the pre-booking process to registration, activities within the hotel, with hotel itself and partners to check out. CHD is taught to provide personalized experience to guests, but is it done securely? The subject will be covered in my next slide. CHD can be found in the following systems. Hotel system, called usually property management system, also restaurant, bar, spa, shops, wireless internet, guest services. Loyalty cards are often linked to guest CHD. Older establishments still take copies of IDs, passport, identity card, and driver licenses, as well as credit cards. Let me describe you how we apply the PCI requirement in an hotel reception. Number one, the, PCI's, the PC central unit is placed in a closet and ventilated cupboard. Number two, system papers with payment card details must be put away in a locked drawer after each transaction. Merchant ticket, reg card, guest paper fine. Number three, to prevent physical access to hotel network, the network jacks must be contained inside the locked cupboard of the front desk. Number four, the hotel must have an access control area where sensitive documents can be stored. The fax machine needs to be in the back office. Number five, cross-cut shredder should be available to hotel employees who handle paper with payment card information, including post-it, faxes, and bills. Number six, video camera should monitor the front desk and each cashier point. And so, number seven, the hotel must maintain an inventory of the electronic payment terminals and regularly inspect them to avoid the tampering. These are the basic best practices to follow the, and comply with PCI in an hotel reception area. I will present now how PCI Hotel Compliance Platform we built with our partner Vigitrust and dedicated to operations. Hotels connect this portal and pay online their annual subscription to the program. The hotel manager is in charge to create credentials for his team. A section is dedicated to policy and procedure. The hotel has to read them, understand, and apply them. When done, each procedure should be tagged in place. Reports are available to follow the progress of each hotel. From this portal in section one, user must follow the PCI online training available in six languages. Through three sessions of 20 minutes each, user cover the basic of PCI standard and hotel scenarios. The awareness training ends with a test. The user are satisfied if they get at least 80% of good answers. This allows to comply with requirement 12.6 from the PCI standard. Best practices for the hospitality industry to comply with PCI. I would suggest to classify and focus on data first. Personal data, cardholder data. Then map this ecosystem where CHPD can be present. Hotel system, POS, websites, e-commerce, paper copies, etc. Protect this ecosystem against physical attacks. Follow PCI guidelines. Consider co reducing technology and processes. The goal is to isolate the CHD environment from, the, from other hotel systems. A call center should also be isolated from the production network. The aim is to devalue the data of as much as possible. Most important subject is the training for users dealing with payment card information, which is 
done upper higher and repeat every year. By regular communication, e-learning, lunch and learn, posters, screensavers, test user knowledge, and so on. When ready, validate PCI compliance. Use external consultant if required. Perform ISV scan. Complete the SAQ and submit it to acquire a bank. Make this a continuous process. Achieve and maintain compliance at all times. I remain at your disposal. If you want to contact me, I put two links uh, to very good PCI resources uh, from Vigitrust and Verizon. They will be provided later in this webinar. I do thank you for your attention. And back to you, Jill. Thank you, Mary Christine, for some excellent insight there. So now I'd like to pass things uh, along to Special Agent in Charge Stuart Tryon, who's going to discuss with us the findings of a broad-based investigation of hundreds of data breaches uh, done by the United States Secret Service. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much. Uh, the U.S. Secret Service is very uh, gratified, very appreciative of this opportunity to be part of the webinar, uh, PCI in the Security Standards Council. We value your partnership and are, are very grateful for the opportunity. Why the Secret Service? Well, the Secret Service has been part of the U.S. payment system since 1865. We were created by Abraham Lincoln to secure the financial system or the financial infrastructure of the United States of America. Today, we work with U.S. law enforcement global law enforcement around the world to prevent cyber and network intrusions. We share information, we share data, and we try to all collaborate to track and apprehend the largest and most notorious criminals that you see in this space. The U.S. Secret Service is authorized to investigate access device fraud, computer fraud, and all fraud under 18 U.S.C. 3056, 18 U.S.C. 1029, and 18 U.S.C. 1030. For the better part of 30 years, the Secret Service has participated with global law enforcement in investigating cyber crimes. Today, the credit card industry is under attack by the adversary for one reason, because credit cards are a very lucrative system to gain financial wealth or to monetize stolen data. At the end of the day, we're often asked, why do we see these persistent credit card attacks on the hotel and the hospitality industry? Why? Because it is just like a bank. It is where the money is. Today, you see hacktivists, criminals, insiders, terrorists, and those who were seeking to fund warfare and espionage, utilizing this tactic to gain financial wealth to fund their cause. Criminals just use it to gain wealth. Insiders have multiple motivations, similar to that of a hacktivist. Espionage, terrorism, and warfare, unfortunately, we're all familiar with those. But at the end of the day, the techniques that is used and that are deployed are all the same. They intrude into a network, usually utilizing some form of a malware, where they harvest credentials. When you look at the modern approach in the anatomy of a hack, you see that there's the reconnaissance, the initial compromise. Well, that reconnaissance is done through many different mechanisms. We're finding today that as a result of social media, many of our corporations, hotels, the, those that hold the credentials, the access device, are known via social media. Often, we put our name, our title, and our position at a particular industry or venue online. The adversary or criminal utilizes that information to now target that individual. We're seeing 40 and 50 million credit card numbers stolen at a time. In one of the largest compromises, 
we found that credit cards were stolen utilizing real credentials that were harvested in one of these methods. Once the network was penetrated, the adversary had done their initial reconnaissance one year prior to actually harvesting and extracting 30 million credit card numbers. The initial compromise was done by simply logging in username and password, copying a file, actually storing that file on the network, and then over time exfiltrating those credit card numbers. So when you look at the anatomy of a hack, you have the reconnaissance. There's many different studies that have been done that shows that this reconnaissance occurs over time, over the course of 8 to 12 months. Once they determine exactly what is of value, where in your network are those crown jewels, as we often say, where those credit card numbers are stored, once they determine that, that's when they really establish their foothold, and then they escalate, and they make sure that they have the right privileges. So their initial compromise may not be the, the provide the best access. So now they will search for perhaps the system administrator or the chief financial officer. Once they take their credentials, they will then utilize that to move within the organization, to move laterally secure the data that they like, and then they will ex exfiltrate it piece by piece or in bulk. But then they also maintain presence inside of your network to clean their footprints, to remove those breadcrumbs. So often what we see in these most uh, prevalent attacks, again, 20 and 40 million cards at a time, is they will first steal a few pieces, perhaps a thousand. And we're often asked, well, why? Well, that's a sample to make sure that they can get the credit cards out of the company. And then they will look for nodes. Where does that particular company store all of them? So if you're a hotelier and you have 20 hotels, is there one central repository for all of your credit card data? And if there is, that becomes where the adversary begins to focus. They look for those nodes, those locations where all of your information is stored, your financial data, and then that is what they focus on. So what we have seen is in companies that have layered security, multi-factor authentication, they understand where their crown jewels or where those credit card numbers are stored, and then they build their security around that network, we find that the adversary tends to move on to a less secure environment, meaning that I will not invest my time and energy in a very secure environment when I have a plethora of other places to, to steal from. Looking at today's standards, we find that, as uh, Stephen Orfe said earlier, oftentimes PCI compliance standards are not adhered to. And that's due to many different reasons. We have seen many industries update their software and then forget to update their standards. We also find that the adversary knows when you update your standards and is waiting for you because, again, they're sitting in your network. They have been in your network for many months, and they too are aware when you're going to update your standards. And they wait. So just when you update your standards and you fall out of compliance, that is when the attack happens. Often we are asked, well, I was compliant on day one, but on day 50 I fell out of compliance, and on day 51 the attack happened. That is because the adversary is sitting in your network waiting for that window of opportunity. As that window of opportunity occurs, that is when the data is exfiltrated. They may have already harvested the data, but because of the, the standards that are in place, that data is not able to leave the organization. But once you fall out of compliance, that is when that data 
tends to move. Oftentimes, we're often asked, why is it that they find these nodes? Because it is timing. The adversary knows when your busy season is. We're going into a high season now in some parts of the world where your vacation and your tourists are now moving to the hotel industry or to the hospitality industry. That's when your data breaches occur. Your recon stages are in that low season when there are not a plethora of numbers available. That is why it is important to have vigilance throughout the year to scrub your network, to understand when your high season is, and to also look at what is different. What is the anomalous behavior that you're detecting on your network? Often we're asked, why is it that it's not detected until after the high season is over? Often we find that the adversary exfiltrates the data just at your busiest time of the year, just when you're focusing on revenue. So are they. They're focusing on their revenue. They're waiting for you to have put the most credit card numbers you have all year long into your one central point, and that's when they extract your data. You do not notice it because, again, they have stolen legitimate credentials. So we find that being compliant and forcing password updates regularly is very efficient in this process and in prevention. We often see that the adversary also, because they have legitimate credentials, they get the same notice, please change your password. And then they, when you change your password, they now have your new password. That's why multi-factor authentication has become the standard to a lot of networks and to a lot of systems, security systems. Lastly, one of the most important things that we see is knowing what the crown jewels are, knowing where the credit card data is, and then securing that appropriately. Oftentimes, the adversary knows the network better than the IT system or the IT administrator. Our last point is the IT administrator. We are currently seeing what we call the zip code attack, which is Everybody in a particular area is getting hit, every hotel. And why is that? Often it is because that hotel network or that ecosystem in a particular city has one or two third-party IT servicing companies. And I do not necessarily have to steal the credentials from the hotel. I steal the credentials of that hotel or the IT security firm that services that hotelier. Once I take that individual's credentials, I now have access to all of their customers. I believe later in the webinar we speak to the third party agreement. Oftentimes that third party agreement does not dictate that a individual company that services a hotel will utilize unique credentials that are unique to that hotel chain. They often use one username and one password for all of their customers. Therefore, if I steal that one administrator's username and password, I now can victimize all of their customers. The adversary knows this and is now targeting because the infrastructure of some of the hotel chains has, has been raised. Therefore, they're looking for that weak link. So they will target that one node of the servicer, the administrator. And once they take the credentials of the administrator, they now have keys to the city. With that, I will turn it back to Jill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. That was fascinating. Um, now I would like to turn things over to Tom Arnold from PSC who's going to present to us about prevention, detection, and response. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, Jill. I'm Tom Arnold, and I'm one of the principals at PSC. 
I am the head of digital forensics, and I have been involved in over 300 QSA projects for a variety of companies, including large and small hotel chains. Recently, we've been heavily engaged in forensic investigations of hoteliers, both in the United States and throughout Europe. Let me talk for just one second about my use of the word vigilance. What does it mean to be vigilant? It means to be attentive, and it means to be watchful. So far, at this point, you've heard the significance of the standards. You've heard the significance of the security programs and having strong security programs. But I wish to impress that vigilance must, in fact, be job one. First off, vigilance begins by knowing the nature of the attacks and the unique characteristics of a cybercrime. So let's start by considering the characteristics of any crime, a typical crime. Someone stealing something from within a hotel, someone coming in and robbing a hotel, a burglar breaks into a hotel. First off, there's motive. This is what drives the criminal. Why do they wish to commit the crime? The second factor is opportunity. Because of a detected security weakness or a detected weakness or some chance that they have to take something, even as simple as a cash drawer left open at the front desk, the criminal has an opportunity to actually fulfill his motive. Next, there's capability. And capability is having the ability to commit the crime. For the gentleman who commits a robbery, he has a weapon that he uses to basically create fear. For the fraudster, he has a trick or device that he's going to use as to enhance his capability to allow him to commit his crime. The final vector when considering any crime is time. In the traditional world, this is the time from the start of the criminal act until it's detected and the police respond. Now, how do these differ in the digital age? Well, we have to add another characteristic, and the characteristic is creativity. Specifically, I can come up and mix both opportunities and capabilities to do something different to attack in a very different way. Next, we have to add a lot more time. My colleague from the Secret Service made a very good case for how long the criminals are on site. They have plenty of times to do reconnaissance inside the network. They have loads of time to craft specialized tools and to make their attack. It is radically different than the traditional world in the criminal age. So given the characteristics, basically, how predictable is a given attack vector or method? So we say that someone's going to hack into the network. How do we predict what route they're going to take to get in? Let me introduce the fact that the human brain is the only computer in the world that can derive a singularity. In essence, they can take influences from a variety of sources and figure out a brand new way to get in that hasn't been thought of. There's also massive changes in opportunity and capability. So let's think about this last year, and let's think about some hotels, and let's think about some ways that even great security systems were circumvented. Phishing attacks, as a good example, we've seen those. And how about weak passwords? Passwords that, for whatever reason, are forgotten or not changed. And then the brand new thing that we're battling right now is malvertisements. And I am saying basically where an advertisement on a legitimate news site contains malware, and when your flash player on your browser runs the news site, it delivers the malware to your system. Very, very damaging approach. So really, keep in mind the uncertainty principle here. There is no point in measuring something if it changes the moment it's measured as a direct result of being measured. What we're saying here is we must be vigilant to the attacks. Let me introduce the concepts of prevention, detection, and response. 
First off, let's understand the elements of something called the kill chain. And the kill chain is how a modern attack actually occurs inside of an organization. Please pay special attention to the four triangles, the four colored triangles at the bottom of this chart. We start with reconnaissance, and this is the point where the bad guy is looking for the weaknesses in various organizations. It might be scanning on the network. It might be uh, internal attack methods, whatever weakness he's looking for. We have a clear opportunity to detect this form of attack and the reconnaissance itself at this point. The next is weaponization. This is where the bad guy tests and establishes how he's going to commit the crime. Then the next is delivery. This is where the weaponized payload is actually delivered into the organization. Again, we have an opportunity to detect this, and you see this in the orange triangle. Once the payload is delivered, we have actual exploitation that takes place inside the organization. If you would, this is the bomb going off inside the network that allows the bad guy to exploit the network itself, expand his credentials, and most importantly, it allows the payload to communicate back to the bad guy. So we see C2, which is called command and control. Again, we have an opportunity to detect this point when the attack is underway. Finally, we get to the last point here, which is exfiltration. And this is where data is being removed from our organization specifically. So how does our defense mechanisms and our vigilance play into this? First, we have prevention. Prevention strives to repel the threats at the perimeter. The bad part with only doing prevention is that the defender must repel all the attacks. The bad guy must succeed only once. Then we have detection. And this is the system that looks for realized threats. Detection is the orange and blue triangles. We're going to use, this is a hard thing to do, by the way. We're going to use real-time analysis. We're going to do batch analysis. And we're going to do threat hunting, specifically inside the organization. Finally, we have response. Response is to close the loop inside our security program and say this is the first responder's action to a detected event. And this is absolutely critical. They must validate the threat, they must understand the threat, and they must establish a short-term containment action plan to stop the threat. This also includes rapid investigation, which is forensic triage, and how to understand the threat. And then at a later time, it includes, finally, full containment. So let's look at how well the industry is actually doing these days. And this is the current information from Mandiant's M-Trends report that was just released. Please note, in 2014, the median time that a bad guy was actually on a site, a hacker was inside the network, was 205 days. The median time in 2016 has dropped to 146 days. This is great news, but still way too long. If the attack is detected internally, basically you have your prevention, your detection systems operating, the bad guy is still on board for 56 days. This is that time vector in our criminal attack. Finally, if there's external notification, the Secret Service is working a case on some other company, and they detect that your IP address is involved somehow with the case they're in, so they contact you and say, hey, you've got a problem, or the card brands contact you, it's 320 days. The longest hotel compromise, this is a case that is only two months old for us, and it's a European case, in 2016 was five years that the bad guy was actually on site. So this is why prevention, detection, and response is so, so important. Let's consider, lastly for me, a little case study of a small European inn. This is a case we had in February of this year. The environment itself was very sort of not too technical. Card data was printed on merchant slips, and merchant slips were kept forever uh, in closets. They had so many merchant slips. They were more in closets, boxes, laying on the floor. They were all over the place. They leveraged third-party reservation systems. And the way the system worked is that they would log into the third party using a shared credential. And in the third party reservation system, it gave them a history of all the reservations they'd ever had through that system, which included all the cardholder data and the CVV2 values, which is that secret secondary authentication data. 
So next, there was no cardholder data captured on their website. Paper and historical transactions were kept forever, and they had very weak audit and security controls. You can see that there's numerous possible internal and external threats. So the lessons learned from this is that fundamental flaws still are an issue and still can cause problems. It's not just the dramatic advanced persistent threat team from China that's attacking, basically. Fundamental flaws still are very significant. Now, as they begin to correct their fundamental flaws, they may introduce some systemic flaws which will and could magnify uh, the weaknesses as well. So remember, prevention, detection, and response, and vigilance. I've added some resources at the end of the slides, and now I'd like to turn it back over to Jill. Thank you, Tom. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, so finally in our webinar, we have Troy Leach, who's going to tie everything together and talk a bit about people, process, and technology from a PCI perspective. So uh, over to Troy. Thank you, and hello, everyone. I'd like to conclude our presentation by sharing some strategy for how we can simplify the approach to payment security while improving the overall confidentiality of cardholder data and through the use of PCI standards and programs to this important industry sector. So as Marie-Christine uh, provided an excellent overview of the complexity of the hospitality space, add to that complexity the diversity of payment acceptance, and it becomes a challenging task as a security professional to consistently monitor the risk and all the threat actors in the environment as the Secret Service and PSC identified. For example, the criminal is looking at each point in the process to find an opportunity to attack, from the manufacturing of the card or counterfeit cards to software, hardware, such as payment terminals, POS systems, ATMs, mobile devices, e-commerce channel, the network, your third parties, and any other attack vector that they can find. And they're getting more and more creative because while there are thousands of points that need to be protected, the criminal only needs to find one vulnerability to be successful. So we need to be creative ourselves and determine ways to eliminate the risk of exposing cardholder data. As you know, the PCI Council has many standards that we developed to address all these attack points, from the manufacturing of chip cards and mag stripe cards to the tampering of payment equipment to proper testing and configuration of all types of payment applications. Our goal is to eliminate opportunity for the criminal and mitigate the risk as much as possible. In addition to our laboratories and testing of hardware and software, we also focus on raising awareness of current payment security threats through white papers and other educational outreach, such as webinars and training, to all of our stakeholders from the security assessors to the payment vendors to the security professionals responsible for managing those card data environments. As our PCI DSS standards highlight, which recently was updated with several new requirements, Payment security requires the engagement of the people, process, and technology to protect against these kinds of threats. And I'd like to share with you now some of the strategies we have for each. Several of these strategies you'll see have been emphasized in the recent release of the PCI DSS version 3.2, but hold very true specifically for hospitality. First, we encourage executive management to be intimately aware of the responsibilities. In fact, in requirement 12.4.1, we added new language for service providers that their C-suite and leadership must help establish the security responsibility for PCI compliance for their organization and be aware of that status. Maintaining that continuous dialogue has proven to minimize the cost of PCI DFS compliance, as shown by research done by the Panama Institute, and help establish good security culture throughout the organization. As important is the dialogue with personnel, such as the systems administrators, who own unique responsibility. There should be regular checks that the procedures that were validated and in place during the time of the assessment remain in place, even when the staff changes or there are changes with service providers. In fact, service providers must confirm personnel follow policy and procedures quarterly in the new requirement 12.11. As has been mentioned earlier in the webinar, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having third parties responsible for protecting your network and their access to your assets and traveler's cardholder information. 
We have several requirements for expectations for the services they offer, and we'll start with the contract, as mentioned in DSS Requirement 12.8. Also as important is making sure that those installing applications are aware of PCI obligations. We've heard stories of individuals at hotels disabling firewalls or removing passwords simply because it was interfering with getting the application to work after the first attempt of installation. That's why we introduced training to professionals that install payment applications so that merchants cannot worry about poor installations by their vendors. That program is called the QIR, Qualified Integrator and Reseller Program, and we now have many professionals trained and supported to that program. But just as important as training of the internal resources that may manage those systems or the supporting infrastructure. We highly encourage hospitality merchants to consider having IT security and other professionals get training on the importance of payment card security. That will help with the dialogue with internal risk departments as well as QSAs that come to interview and assess the process. Speaking of process, the process is the most important part and it's constantly changing based on business needs and technology advancements. So we have to make sure that there are requirements in place to make, evaluate the security of those process. And it starts with being aware of where cardholder information is. We have a requirement in 3.5.1 that was introducing new expectations for service providers to document and validate not only the data flow diagram in requirement one, but now also the cryptography they use to protect the confidentiality of cardholder information. We also ask that these t changes be tested regularly. So we've introduced several requirements around after a significant change, we verify PCI requirements remain in place after that change. You can find that in requirement 6.4.6, .6, as well as in the penetration test requirements in 11.3. We also look to make sure that service providers have an ability to respond to critical security control failures in the new requirement 10.8.1. And as always, it's important to understand the process to find ways that we can remove and eliminate unnecessary storage of cardholder data. In fact, we used to call requirement zero the ability to have a datagram and be able to evaluate where cardholder information flow, flows through the organization in order to have a sustainable process to protect the cardholder information itself. Speaking of technology, it also starts with the most difficult decisions, which is determining whether to upgrade payment equipment. If you are a franchiser, this is even more difficult depending on whether you allow the franchise e to purchase their own payment equipment and convincing them to upgrade for security reasons. It's processing payments, so why would they want to upgrade? However, with all the advancements such as EMV and point-to-point -point encryption and tokenization available in terminals and the ability to accept NFC and mobile payment tokens, we're hoping the incentive for new forms of payments and the ability to reduce the cost of the PCI DSS assessment will help motivate organizations to invest in updated technology. Especially as attacks by criminals are evolving so quickly and identifying your payment application is patched and up to date by independent labs is a low cost, high reward check for any merchant and we have prevented some of the most recent breaches that we've seen. Speaking of looking ahead, we also have the reliance on older security as a step to missing some of the challenges with merchant environments. Take, for example, the recent SSL and SHA-1 migration challenges. There are old technologies such as SSL version 3, which is now a 20-year-old technology, that actually caught the industry off guard, even though newer technology existed for years, and the writing was on the wall with all the security vulnerabilities that were inevitably discovered. For a complex hotel environment, this should be a regular sanity check to better plan and budget for future risk. Also, we want to highly encourage you to evaluate skimming education for your check-in locations and other places where criminals may have physical access. You can do searches on the internet for overlay and skimming attacks that can be implemented in literally two seconds. Being able to know the basic signs, such as sticky keys or funny entry of the card, are simple techniques that any employee should be able to detect. We offer white papers on this topic free to download on our website. Finally, as part of any technology consideration, consider the investment once again 
once again, for point-to-point -point encryption to securely encrypt cardholder data or EMV chipped acceptance to eliminate counterfeit fraud or tokenization directly at the card acceptance location. As these security mechanisms are going to reduce the risk, reduce your assessment criteria, and effectively deter. And that really is our ultimate goal, to devalue the data so that travelers and hotels, restaurants, and other places where payments are accepted have high confidence in the security of the transaction and can focus on improving their guest experience rather than worrying about exposing their network to criminals. Thank you for your time today, and now I'll turn this back over to Jill, our moderator. So thank you, Troy, and thank you to Vanessa, Mary Christine, Stuart, and Tom for all of your very insightful presentations. Um, on the screen now, you can see some additional resources that our panelists wanted to share with you for more information about today's topic. And we're going to be sharing this webinar on the PCI Council's website um, shortly after we conclude today. As I'm sure you know, feedback is very important to us. And so as webinar attendees, you'll be receiving a survey from us. And I hope you'll share your feedback about it. I hope you've enjoyed today's session and found it useful. I'm afraid that's all we have time for now. So once again, I'd like to say thank you to our panelists. And thank you for joining us for this webinar.